Under the right conditions, Fibonacci circles can be used to identify important areas in both price and time. First, we'll need to mark the interval of a major trend using cyclical lines. If you're not familiar with time analysis on charts, I have already made resources on the topic that can be found on the Ascendcore website. Next, we apply the Fibonacci retracement and extension tool, which I also have resources on. We apply this Fibonacci retracement to the full price range of the time interval that has been chosen. So it will be from the low to the high of this uptrend immediately following this stock's IPO. We'll just be interested in the whole numbers. So like the cyclical vertical lines for time, this will show cyclical horizontal lines for price. As a stable reversal gives way to a stable downtrend, these even intervals give us a grid. We place a Fibonacci circle with the first point at the peak of the last uptrend, which is the beginning of this current downtrend. We then extend the second point down towards the bottom right corner because we're in the context of a developing downtrend. Specifically, this second point will be moving two intervals of time to the right side and two intervals of price down. So basically, this is a 2x2 two two grid that contains the Fibonacci circle. For this method, the only circle we really care about is the first one in the center, the 0.236 circle. But I'll also leave the one circle to demonstrate how it fits neatly into our 2x2 two two grid box. Within this arrangement, we care about certain angles that relate to the central intersection between all the grids and the central 0.236 circle that surrounds it. Theoretically, a perfect shift in the balance of buyers and sellers will create a kind of transition or exclusion zone around this central area, followed by a more probable reversal of this current downtrend that will send price back up towards the previous high within one interval of time and price. However, in reality, this ideal situation doesn't happen too often. So like in this case, when price doesn't even enter into the central circle, we keep the circle on the same horizontal level since it's a major support, but we move it one more interval in terms of time towards the right side so that the central circle covers the same approximate price range, but it moves over further into the future as price also moves further into the future. Then the idea is if there is a reversal of this weakening downtrend, price is more likely to follow this approximate path towards the top right corner of our new adjusted box, which is now comprised of three intervals of time and still two intervals of price. Now when price finally does enter this central circle, that higher chance of a reversal does materialize, but of course it will be unrealistic to see price always follow this exact trend line on the way up. With the ongoing uptrend rising towards previous highs, we can now repeat the same process, except we now use the interval of the last downtrend. In terms of determining the equal intervals of the price range from the high to the low, and the even intervals in terms of time, which is also based from the high to the low of this downtrend. The end result is our grid, where the first point of a Fibonacci circle begins on the bottom left corner at the lowest price of the reversal area which began this current uptrend. We then extend the circle's second point, two intervals in time to the right, and two intervals in price up. The main theory is price will revolve and rotate around this central circle, because in a range-bound context where there's a smooth transition from this bullish uptrend towards a selling advantage for a new downtrend, the bearish reversal is more likely to take place around that area marked by the central circle, and the resulting downtrend is more likely to take place for that approximate price and time range, approximating this angle pointing down to the bottom right corner. Yet again, this ideal situation doesn't happen within the 2x2 two two grid, as price does indeed stay away from it, behaving as a kind of exclusion area as price goes around it. Again, we can keep the central circle at the same approximate price range where the market is currently at, 
but as price moves further in time towards the right and into the future, we will also have to move this central circle towards the right and into the future. That means the second point is now three intervals of time to the right side, and still two intervals of price up from the first point, which naturally fits the one circle within a 3 by 2 box. And if there is an ideal reversal within the central circle, the angle we're interested in for the downtrend is this one down to the bottom right corner. This general path is followed, but as usual there will be some variation and price won't follow these exact guidelines strictly. In a case like this when price peaks sharply, it could also be an option to move the central circle higher, to move up along with rising price. Then that overlapping area between the two circles can narrow down a price and time range when volatility is particularly high, such as in this case. This second option gave us a 3x3 square, which is usually the largest you would want to go. It is of course possible to expand further, but the circles get too large to be of more precise use. And it gets further away from that most ideal proportion of the 2x2 two two square. It's best to have an actual square 2x2 two two or 3x3. Three three. These 3x2 three rectangles are alright in terms of size for not being too large or too small, but usually they'll be the second option after the perfect 2x2 two two or 3x3 three three squares. Unless one of these 3x2 rectangular configurations gets the central circle closer to where price is currently trading, like with the first example. Even if a grid is made up of relatively short time intervals and relatively narrow price ranges, expanding beyond a 3x3 box to something like this will still be quite rare. Now let's make a new grid after the recent uptrend has finished. In theory, if the chart follows ideal proportions, the current downtrend will continue to drop for one interval of price and time, and going further under the upper 70s will be more difficult, without another major increase in selling pressure. And the idea is this gives an advantage for a reversal back to another uptrend. As usual, our first point is at the high of the downward reversal that began this current downtrend. Because it's a downtrend, the second point of the Fibonacci circle moves down two intervals of price and two intervals of time to the right. In this case, price does enter that central circle, but there's no reversal and that's okay because reversals aren't always guaranteed, especially when there's exceedingly high selling pressure able to drive down through this barrier. So even though a reversal back up was more probable upon contact with this central circle, we still need to pay attention to the rows of red candles and increasing red volume in the short term context. Since price has moved below our first option for a central circle, and is moving further into the future to the right side, we need to move the central circle down and to the right side. If we first just move down to lower the price range, the overlapping area is actually where there is the most contention, and theoretically stronger support which still does get broken through with sufficient selling pressure during the gap down. When the central circle gets moved to the right as well to cover the dimension of time, it does cover the price and time range when there's stronger support potential to reverse the established downtrend. Here's another situation closer to reality. No significant uptrend develops because during the time in this central circle, there are no sustained bullish developments. But at the same time, there's no significant increase in selling pressure like last time, so instead, the chart remains relatively neutral into this defined range. Also, even though this is a 3x3 three three square, these are less preferable conditions since the price and time intervals used were larger, resulting in a larger circle and naturally a reduction in narrow precision. That's why it's also an option to use smaller segments of a trend to yield smaller grids during potential reversals and continuations. It's also preferable to use smaller trends that are in a defined range bound context such as this one. In this situation, the central circle is acting like an exclusion zone. Price doesn't decisively enter it and reverse, but instead repels around it. 
So with price falling onto a defined support, it's an option to keep the central circle on the same approximate price range, but move it over to the right side as price moves over to the right side further into the future. With this move, the central circle does catch up with price as it begins to congest around this defined support area, and there's still yet to be a major continuation or reversal, even after price has gone through the entire circle. We can repeat the same thing, leaving the central circle at the same approximate price range, but moving it over further to the right into the future. There's actually a gradual drop and bearish continuation developing, but it's not exceedingly fast. So as price falls, even lowering the circle will be of little use for defining the more likely reversal area for a larger uptrend. But it's still good for capturing these minor upswings. And this highlights why when price strays further away from the 2x2 or 3x3 square, an ideal reversal becomes less likely. As proportions of the Fibonacci circle get stretched out and less balanced towards a rectangular configuration. So if no swift reversal takes place in a medium to short term context within the central circle, like with this example, a reversal later on is not impossible, but a swift and stable one like this becomes much less likely, because the balance of buyers and sellers during that particular duration is not following the most ideal proportions.